All right, we still have a few people trickling in, but Chris, I think you can go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I think it's gonna be an outstanding uh, se section of information. Um, some quick background, um, as a result of the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals relationship with Consumer Brands Association and University of Tennessee and Freight Waves, an issue has come to um, a significant interest about the dynamics of the transportation economics going forward. I'm Chris Adderton, Vice President with CSCMP, and very pleased to do the quick introduction this, this morning, this afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Rob Haddock. Uh, Rob's with Coca-Cola. Rob's also a member of the Consumer Brands Association Supply Chain Committee, as well as a board member of CSCMP. Rob? Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let me give you a few moments of uh, kind of a backstory as to how we got to this um, next hour. You know, in my experience, transportation is more complicated than some of the other procured items. And uh, I know you supply chain professionals probably are constantly getting questions on Monday mornings from sales marketing, the C-suite, saying, hey, I saw something over the weekend about transportation, something about the spot market, something about the drivers. And um, I, I think I was on a call with consumer brands and we were going through some updates and I said, listen, is there anything that's out there that would help me bring a simplified message back to my leadership uh, that would say, okay, this is how the transportation economics work, just to build their brain around a little bit. Uh, and one conversation led to another, um, working with Chris at uh, CSCMP, and then we got in touch with, with Tom and Zach. And uh, before you know it, you know, we had a, a, this event put together. And one of the things was really insightful for me, right about that same time, uh, Freight Waves put out an overview of the spot market. And the timing was perfect because I was able to take that very simplified view of what is um, contracted versus what is spot and share that with senior leadership. And I thought, listen, if we could do more of this, it might make those Monday morning discussions a little bit more um, less painful. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so all about getting uh, you know, people outside of the transportation space a little bit more informed on how this industry works. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Zach and they can take us uh, deeper into it. Excellent. Thank things. you, Chris yeah. and Rob. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm Tom Goldsby, the University of Tennessee. Again, real pleasure to be with you today to talk about two things I'm very passionate about, transportation and economics. So when you bring them together, you can only imagine how excited I am. But here are the uh, logistics for our webinar today. Uh, that uh, if you are having any issues, uh, there are lines in which you can call in uh, for, for help. Uh, we do encourage your participation today as well. So we would like for you to submit questions that you have about our subject, and we're gonna reserve a little bit of time at the end of the session to address those questions. And I'm gonna be watching the, uh, the question board throughout the session. So please submit your questions to us. And then also, just so you're aware, this uh, session is being recorded and you're gonna have access uh, to the playback um, very soon. I think uh, this time tomorrow you'll have it. And if you do have any questions, comments uh, about the uh, event today, please reach us at gsci at utk.edu. I'm gonna turn back to Rob for uh, introductions here. All right, thank you, Tom. Well, Tom, you're gonna to be taking the, uh, the baton first, but Tom Goldsby, Professor of Supply Chain Management, uh, James Haslam, Chair of Logistics, and then Zach, Strickland, Director of Market Intelligence over at Freight Waves. And Tom, I know they'd rather hear more from you than from me. So baton's back to you and let's run with it. All right, thank you, Rob. So here's an agenda of what we believe is going to be a uh, fast action, hard hitting uh, hour long session. Uh, our introductions are almost complete. Uh, and then we're going to get into what I refer to as transportation economics foundations. I'm going to cover that content in about 25 minutes and then try to get out of the way for Zach, who's going to provide a more contemporary perspective on the transportation market and speak to the tools that he and his company Freight Waves uh, brings to market to help shippers, carriers, brokers, anyone in the transportation space to better understand the dynamics uh, associated with transportation economics. And finally, 
again, we've reserved a little time there at the end for you to submit your questions and, and have those addressed by myself and Zach. So uh, I do wanna take just one more moment to introduce the Global Supply Chain Institute that is hosting today's session. Uh, you can read uh, our, our mission there uh, as, uh, as indicated. And uh, fortunately, we've got a beautiful day like that today in Knoxville, Tennessee, just like it's depicted in the photo. Um, but uh, the GSCI is our primary avenue for academic industry collaboration uh, and information sharing. So it's a great pleasure of, uh, of ours to, to host the event. I really appreciate the team back at GSCI for making today possible. So these are the four driving questions that um, were brought before Rob and me um, uh, and Zach to address today. Um, again, Rob provided a lot of impetus in the background for us to, to better understand these questions. What are the factors that shape transportation economics, namely in the truckload market? So we're gonna talk about transportation widely but uh, really hone in on, on the truckload market, which is perhaps the closest thing to a commodity that we have in domestic transportation. Uh, the second question, how do prices settle at negotiated rates? Both myself and Zach will attempt to address that question. And then we'll move primarily into Zach with uh, the third and fourth questions. The third question, what are the key performance indicators that drive pricing research? And finally, how can we keep up with market dynamics, which is uh, the great challenge, of course. Well, I'm gonna start off with a broad perspective, and this comes to us from CSCMP and their annual state of logistics report. Uh, this report was issued back in June, looking back to the previous year, 2019. And here you see the five basic modes of transportation amounting to uh, somewhat more than a billion, or I'm sorry, a trillion dollars in spend last year you see that the vast majority of that, 75% is going toward the first category, truck and parcel. Hence, that's one reason why we wanna focus on the trucking sector in particular, uh, but also everything moves by truck at some point in its distribution, just about everything, I should say. And you break down that $795 billion and you see that a significant share of it is going to the full truckload market, uh, the, and, and right along with that figure of about 307 billion, just right there alongside it, 308 billion goes toward private and dedicated, which again is, is going to be a, a, another variation of truckload. Uh, so that's just another reason why we wanna focus on that particular sector. And it tends to be the most dynamic uh, of all sectors of transportation uh, purchasing. So uh, there, with those two categories, you're catching right at about 615 billion of the 795 billion spent. And I should point out that that $795 billion spend is domestic transportation, dollars spent here on the US to move product about the country. So uh, that's uh, just a little bit of level set. Uh, let's get into the distinctions between truckload and less than truckload carriers. Um, to the, uh, the novice, they may seem like subtle distinctions as described here, with regard to the nature of the service and the size of the shipment. However, the, uh, the fundamental nature of the operations is totally different between truckload and, and less than truckload carriers, particularly on a nationwide basis. And so uh, truckload carriers tend to have the lowest barrier to entry. Uh, that's why we do have more than 400,000 registered motor carriers in the United States and the vast majority of those are going to be truckload carriers because any mom and pop um, with, uh, with some capital or access to it can get into the trucking sector and they're gonna be active in the truckload sector where you need a tractor, a trailer, a driver, and a uh, little more than that. Um, now granted, most of those uh, mom and pop operations are one and two truck operations uh, we tend to get into a higher uh, level of concentration in the sector when we're talking about, say, 10,000 power units or more. That tends to be in a, in a much more uh, concentrated, smaller set of carriers, and those are the ones that are going to have the most influence uh, in moving the market, certainly. But just a little bit of distinction here between the truckload and less than truckload segments. And again, our primary focus today 
is going to be on truckload movement, the largely dedicated movements between point A and B. Looking at some factors that affect cost and pricing for a shipment, uh, this is a diagram I've been using for several years uh, when teaching transportation. I think it's helpful to understand the product related factors as distinct from what I call the movement and market related factors. And there in the left hand column, you see a whole host of things that are related to the nature of the product that's being moved, the nature of the shipment. So there we have the classic weight and density also the stowability uh, of the product, the ease or difficulty of handling the product. Uh, and then we get into some areas of liability, the, the value of the product, uh, whether or not there are any special provisions like temperature or humidity control required, hazardous materials, uh, or provisions of security that are required or special provisions of security. And then finally, just an outright liability kind of insurance coverage associated with the, uh, the uh, certainty of, of uh, handling and, and liability and freight. Over in the right hand column, uh, these are things that are more specific to the origin destination aspects of what's being moved. And so we have the location of markets, certainly the raw distance is a primary driver of, of cost, uh, but also whether or not we're going into a city or a rural area. Um, and uh, if we're going into a city, just recognize that your, your tractor, your trailer, your driver are gonna be held up uh, maybe have to deal with uh, congestion and uh, just the, the, the hassles of getting in and out of the city as well as tolls that might be associated with going into a metropolitan area. Also, the balance of the freight traffic comes into play. And, and that's going to relate to the slide I'm going to go into next with regard to the density of the freight traffic. But with every head haul, there's a backhaul. We've got to get the tractor and the driver back to the domicile. And so I think a lot of shippers are only concerned about getting from point A to B, and that's understandable. However, we've got to recognize that the carrier is going to have responsible of getting that, care, that driver and piece of equipment back to the original domicile point A. And so that factors into pricing. Also, the seasonality of product moves. We are getting into what is traditionally the peak season uh, as we approach the holidays. Uh, and um, many of you are thinking, haven't we already experienced peak season given the rush uh, that we're seeing in many sectors of our economy, um, particularly uh, refrigerated and frozen, uh, has been a, there's been a real rush in those sectors. But uh, we are getting into what is traditionally the surge season, um, and so that's going to be factored into to pricing. Also, the nature and extent of regulations. Keep in mind that states have uh, ultimate responsibility for matters of safety and social regulation, and for that reason, then different states are going to have um, a different cost of doing business. So it's not just something that's found within the national confines of the market, but also um, within the confines of individual states. We no longer have the, the, the rate bureaus that uh, are setting prices, but uh, you know, there is still some influence on uh, what the going rate is within a, uh, a state. And you're going to see reasons for that. Um, with some sub subsequent data that I'm going to share with you. Also, of course, uh, as soon as you cross national boundaries, you're talking about international shipments and a whole new host of rules and regulations and uh, a lot of transaction costs associated with crossing national boundaries. Also, something that was added to this slide um, was some input from Rob about the slack time uh, associated with load, unload, as well as between loads and the fact that uh, given that we're dealing with a driver shortage in this country that continues to worsen as the average age of drivers uh, is getting to be, uh, I think, well north of 55, uh, we're, uh, we're having a hard time bringing new drivers in. And as a result, the, the, the driver shortage perpetuates. Um, it's a difficult sector to populate. The, the life of a driver is, is, is very uh, difficult. And as a result, not a lot of interest among young people in particular coming into uh, the driving profession. And so we often have to pay an hourly wage as well as the per mile basis that is the convention in transportation economics. Technology adoption, this sector is seeing a lot of uh, technology adoption, certainly with regard to, to, to tractors, but also uh, the information technologies associated with uh, enhancing supply chain visibility. Uh, we're also seeing the onboard uh, recording devices, uh, GPS, a whole host of technologies have come 
into uh, pretty routine use, uh, some by law, others by choice, that uh, is somewhat raising the cost of entry uh, into the sector. And we expect uh, perhaps autonomous to, to be the next great advent to make its way into the sector. And then finally, the competition level. Like any market, the more suppliers you have, the more com competitive the price situation. Absent uh, competitors, you're gonna experience uh, some degree of inflation. Now, I do wanna draw your attention to the asterisks here at the bottom of the table, that the economics can improve with volume commitments and consistency, as well as a term I refer to as an affinity uh, or, or a certain uh, likeness uh, that could take place between shipper and carrier. If uh, you become a shipper of choice, um, a preferred shipper uh, by a carrier, uh, you would hope to have the most competitive price available. And how can you achieve that? Well, probably by not playing tricks and games with the carriers uh, and doing things like paying your invoices on time, being easy to do business with. Those are some ways to, to achieve that affinity uh, and become that shipper of choice. And we always have ebbs and flows in the market. Sometimes it's a buyer's market, sometimes it's a seller's market. When it becomes a seller's market, it's very helpful if you're one of those carriers that or one of the shippers that carriers have a certain uh, positive affinity for and are going to give you a higher priority service when times get tight. So I mentioned earlier the notion of a, of a network and particularly the, the premise of a of density within that network. Again, every uh, outbound shipment from A to B also has a return shipment uh, B to A to get the driver and piece of equipment back to the origin. And I think that's something that many uh, shippers sometimes forget. Uh, the cost that the carrier incurs, they're very focused on, on the going rate for, for their um, particular move, but the cost of operation is something that we wanna shed some light on uh, today. So minimizing deadhead miles and unproductive wait times are the name of the game. So it's very similar to what we see in the airline industry where load factors, you know, what, how many, uh, revenue generating seat miles do you generate. And um, during the pandemic, a lot of carriers have had to take a lot of capacity out of the air because there just aren't as many people flying these days. And um, it's important in the airline industry to have load factors in excess of 90% if you want to have any chance whatsoever of being profitable. Similarly, uh, we have operating ratios that we watch in the truckload sector that need to be upwards of, of 90% as well if they want to achieve um, any, any opportunity for profit and being able to reinvest back in the business. So just keeping the network perspective in mind is important. Also, uh, just to bring a little bit of accounting uh, into the equation here, I promise not to go into a, a long lecture on this, but it is important to understand three distinct types of costs. Uh, primarily, we're going to be talking about accounting costs, and these are the monetary outlays that any business is going to experience and that they're going to need to uh, counter against the, the revenues that they have coming into the business. So these are the true accounting expenditures, but we also need to keep in mind economic costs. These may not involve outlays of cash, but rather we're talking about the alternative uses available to our resources. And this is really important when you think about a carrier, perhaps with a, a multitude of customers that they could serve, who's going to get capacity when it's limited? Who's gonna get the attention when the carrier can choose from any number of bids or, or, or load tenders for that service? And what they're thinking about are what are the opportunity costs of serving one customer as opposed to another? Um, Economic costs factor in pretty significantly in a lot of ways for the carrier in that they've got to think about ways that they leverage their capital uh, in the business. Do they invest in technology to become more efficient? Do they invest in recruiting, retaining uh, drivers? Uh, all these are economic costs that the carrier would need to take into consideration. Similarly, shippers have opportunity costs too, but um, we'll focus uh, for uh, the purposes of today's discussion on those associated with the carrier's perspective. And then finally, the social cost. There are many social or societal costs associated with transportation activity. For one thing, we all rely on transportation to, to get the goods uh, that serve our daily needs. 
Um, and that's a societal benefit. However, the fact that we share a common right of way, we share a common infrastructure, the fact that our two ton automobile is driving right alongside the 20, 25 ton tractor trailer is, is something that we've got to be thinking about. Um, the fact that, and by the way, a 25 ton tractor trailer isn't a fully loaded tractor trailer. So we can get 80,000 pounds uh, on any, any roadway out there. Um, some we can get even more weight uh, depending upon state regulations. The fact that we share that infrastructure means that there are risks um, uh, among carriers that most industrial activities don't face. If you think about an industrial manufacturing environment, that's usually off separate from the city and you know what happens at the plant kind of stays at the plant. But meanwhile, transportation is involved in our common daily activity. We all come across tractor trailers every day. Also, we got to keep in mind that transportation is the biggest energy consumer and also the biggest polluter of all industrial activities that we have. And those uh, emissions come with, uh, with social cost. Uh, and so we've got to take these social costs into consideration. And those are primarily issues of policy concern, but from a carrier standpoint, they very much, again, have to take these into consideration. And then uh, you see some additional cost measures um, also that we need to keep in mind. Uh, the logistics total cost is from a shipper's perspective, as they think that transportation is but one of many different costs that go into performing the logistics provision, making sure that they have the right product at the right place, at the right time uh, to meet their customers' needs. But um, transportation will usually represent half, sometimes more than half of total logistics cost. However, uh, we cannot make logistics and supply chain decisions uh, relying solely on transportation. Um, that's a common lesson that we extol uh, in our classroom, even though transportation is a very big cost and also perhaps the most easily measured accounting cost that we have, we need to be careful to make sure we're making decisions based on a total cost perspective. And then to take that total cost notion even further beyond logistics, you might get into a total cost of ownership premise, which looks at the cost of material and product throughout the life cycle of the materials and products. So this clearly goes well beyond logistics, procurement, production, as we might get into areas like warranty, um, we get into recalls, we get into anything involved in the full life cycle of the materials and products gets factored into our decision-making here. Also another related um, cost measurement is the cost of poor quality, sometimes referred to as the cost of poor service. Uh, in logistics. And so this is the cost associated with a defect. And we find that whenever there's a claim, a return, or any form of, of lost revenue, it could mean some form of discounting because we need to win back customers' confidence, any notion like that. So um, just a broad perspective on some accounting costs and uh, measures uh, that we're going to want to take into consideration in this broader discussion of transportation economics. Now I've got one way of depicting where rate negotiations are gonna come into play here. Uh, you see the value of service at the top of the diagram, which you might regard as the ceiling for negotiations. And that ceiling is largely gonna be based upon an economic cost, the opportunity cost of doing this yourself. What is the cost of us resorting to an alternative mode or an alternative carrier, or perhaps even doing this service ourselves? and hence moving to private carriage. Um, generally, you would move to private carriage if you have a really high degree of control that's required in moving your product. And so that's kind of an extreme circumstance, but some companies out there are facing that quandary as to whether or not to do it themselves or to continue buying in the open market. However, as we move toward the ceiling, this area of rate variance, you see uh, expense being depicted in different ways. And this is largely from the carrier's perspective or the supply side of the equation that the lowest standards are merely the out of pocket cost or what would be referred to as the variable cost. And this is generally speaking, if, if a carrier is moving a product from A to B and then another customer, maybe someone near A wants to ship to some point near B, the, uh, the carrier might be willing to charge the bare bones minimum of saying, well, we're already moving from A to B, we'll just charge you for the incremental additional cost of going a little bit out of our way 
to accommodate the second customer. Most carriers are not going to even offer that uh, as an option, but uh, if you find a really generous one, uh, they might take that into consideration. Rather, we're going to get into higher levels um, of the floor here. We're going to get to the average variable cost, so looking at the cost across a multitude of customers, multitude of operations, and finding what that variable is and charging that rate. We might try to get into the fully allocated costs, which is where we start to allocate fixed cost investment as well, so the cost of the, the trucks, the trailers, the facilities, the maintenance equipment and so forth and allocate those costs. But then there's this true cost of service, which is a rather ubiquitous notion, very hard to quantify as to what the carrier's real cost of service is on a specific move by move basis. Uh, but anyway, it's still a good notion to have out there as the floor, but really our negotiation should happen somewhere between that true cost of service and the value of the service. And Zach's going to provide some more specific uh, detail on how he looks at it um, with a similar sort of diagram. All right, moving into a lot of data here. Uh, if we just look at the, the leftmost portion of this table, we see vehicle-based cost and driver-based cost for uh, U.S. motor carriers. These data come to us from the American Transportation Research Institute, or ATRI, late last year. And so I think they're fairly timely numbers. And you'll see that fuel cost is the largest vehicle-based cost, um, followed by the truck trailer lease or payments. Um, if we look at driver-based costs, though, that's where you see um, the driver wages are the single largest line item. Uh, driver benefits coming in uh, with another 18 cents as a US national average. So there you see $1.82 uh, per mile is the average cost nationwide late last year. Um, if you look to the right though, you'll see that where you operate makes a big difference. That the Northeast has uh, the most expensive cost of operation for a variety of reasons, but mostly because uh, the driver wages are gonna be uh, somewhat higher, the driver benefits are gonna be somewhat higher, um, and, uh, and fuel is gonna be somewhat higher in the Northeast. Uh, Compare that to the Southwest, which runs at $1.57.7. And you, again, just look at the individual numbers and you can assess where the differences come into play. But primarily in the areas of fuel and driver wage rates make a big difference. Looking at fuel, again, the largest uh, shipment related or product related cost factor. Um, as of earlier this week, uh, fuel was a pretty reasonable national average of $2.00. 39 cents per gallon uh, for, for uh, diesel retail prices. And that is almost half of what it was when fuel was at its peak back there in 2008, July 2008. You'll see that it was $4.76 a gallon. So we're about half of what it was, uh, almost precisely half what it was uh, back in, in 2008, which those were some really hard times for carriers. Uh, a lot of carriers didn't make it out of that, that fuel crisis. But uh, fuel is the most variable cost that we face. And for that reason, we often will index our contracts uh, against the uh, Department of Energy numbers that you see here. Also, when it comes to buying fuel, the size of the fleet matters uh, a great deal. Uh, you see that if you have fewer than five power units, you can expect your prices, again, from the same data set we saw from ATRI late last year, it's going to be about 51 cents. Uh, per mile. Uh, meanwhile, at the other end of the spectrum, if you operate more than a thousand power units, you can expect it to be more than a dime less per mile. 39.1 cents is what indicates. I'm not seeing a, much of a difference there if you run one tractor to a hundred tractors, but meanwhile, when you get north of a hundred tractors, it looks like the economies of scale start to set in and you start to see some pretty generous discounts. Similarly, you start to see discounts um, in the insurance premiums that are paid, uh, which is depicted in the right-hand set of, of bar charts, and uh, a dramatic difference. You're paying less than a third if you operate uh, more than a thousand power units compared to having fewer than five. So uh, some pretty dramatic departures there from the supply side of the equation. What I'd like to do now, though, is transition to Zach, and Zach's going to talk about uh, where supply meets demand.
and the specific market influences that he and his organization at Freight Waves, uh, what they look at in the way of key performance indicators, and also some of the tools that they brought to market to help shippers, carriers, brokers, anyone with any touch in the transportation sector to better understand the ups and downs of the market. So Zach, take it away. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, so yes, you, uh, you definitely covered, we're going to have some overlap here for sure, but I think it's good that, you know, we're kind of building into the section that I'm going to talk about. And this is the more, this is the harder to measure aspect of, you know, transportation costs. You know, I used to be, uh, I spent a majority of my career pricing uh, freight and it is, you know, on paper, it looks a lot easier uh, than it actually is. Uh, there's a lot of variables involved with it. Uh, some of those slides you were showing us were reminiscent of some of the first things that I learned back in the day where, uh, you know, calculating all the density and the commodity, for the, the price of liability, et cetera. I mean, they're, they're all major factors and it's, and it's one of those things that's really hard to put all into one bucket. So I'm gonna try to, you know, explain a little bit about, uh, you know, what we, you know, how we measure some of these and how we can, you know, outside of some of those accounting costs that we're talking about, what's influencing that total transportation cost that, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at and the reason that it is so variable. Uh, so what is the market? So the market is essentially, you know, and from our perspective that we're talking about today is all these influencing factors that, are you know making that rate uh, that you're paying for truckload in this uh, specific instance go from $1.50 a mile to $2.10 a mile, then back down to $1.40 a mile. Uh, you know there is you know at, at some point the market influence can actually pull uh, that cost per mile below uh, the actual cost of operating that vehicle, and that is an insane thing to even talk about. I mean, if you're talking about, I guess, in the terms of actual material goods, uh, you know, when they have, when you have discounts, just trying to clean out the inventory, clearance rack type stuff, that occurs in freight the same way that it occurs in, uh, you know, in Target when they're trying to get rid of their seasonal items. Uh, but as Tom was pointing out, there is, you know, uh, you know, the backhaul aspect of it is really what uh, carriers are trying to discount there. So it does make sense for them to offer a rate below that of the actual cost of operating that vehicle for that segment, but they do make up for it in other areas. But, uh, you know, majority of what I'm going to talk about here is definitely focused on this market influence and not that cost of operation, uh, which is more fixed and hard coded into a lot of carriers, you know, the way that they price and, and look at things. So, who influences the market? Who is, you know, who are our biggest players? Obviously, uh, shippers, larger companies that uh, are trying to push those goods out into the country, out into the world. Uh, they control demand. Demand is obviously one of the biggest uh, sides of the equation in supply and demand. Uh, where we see some of these, uh, you know, discrepancies, a lot of what we're seeing right now is a demand side event. And it's simply, uh, the fact that demand has increased to a point that was not expected or anticipated by the carriers. So shippers have, you know, a lot of uh, inconsistent volumes right now. Uh, not a lot of uh, companies out there forecasted COVID-19. Uh, so therefore, you know, instead of getting five loads a day uh, from Coke, some of them are getting 20 loads a day, uh, you know, and that's, that's something that carriers have a, have a lot of trouble uh, negotiating, especially if they don't know it's coming. Uh, they, they have a network that they're trying to build uh, and set up and be in the right spot at the right time. But if demand surges in any one of those nodes that you saw on Tom's diagram, uh, that throws the entire thing out of balance. And now they have to uh, struggle to get that back into balance uh, with what it's doing. So the carriers supply side influence. These are the people, uh, the you know, the drivers are, of course, responsible for uh, making sure that they are in the right places at the right time, uh, managing where they are, how many of them to keep on, uh, you know, on staff. Uh, Right-sizing your fleet has been a big issue here over the last uh, few months, specifically uh, talking about seating some of these drivers or, or you know, seating some of these trucks uh, where, you know, a lot of these schools and training facilities were shut down for, for three to four months. Now they don't have as much influx, uh, influx uh, personnel coming into the, uh, the space. 
to make sure that they have enough to you know, account for that demand increase. Brokers, 3PLs, 4PLs, these are the middle, the middle man in the operation. Uh, they're the ones that essentially are negotiating between the two. They, uh, you know, a lot of shippers don't want to deal with, uh, you know, negotiating or finding all these different carriers. It's not their primary business uh, by any means. So it's they hand it off to somebody that may have a little bit more expertise. And certainly a lot of these brokers and 3PLs have done a really good job of, uh, you know, really improving technology, uh, communication, uh, all this stuff that's really there to facilitate an easy uh, communication or back and forth between the carriers and the shippers uh, of the world. And, and that's really what the, the value that they bring to it. But they have an influence here in the way that they can aggregate uh, a bunch of shippers together, smaller shippers at that, and then use that buying influence to negotiate with carriers. Uh, the same is, uh, you know, true for the reverse, where they do have access to a lot of these carriers. They can go and find some of the, they have relationships with some of these smaller carriers can bring them uh, to the forefront for some of these other shippers that may not have the tools to, uh, to get uh, where they, you know, potentially they just don't have time to get out and, and find some of these spots. Because like I said, it's not necessarily their main type of business. So the factors that influence uh, the market rate, service. Service is obviously a big deal to a lot of shippers out there. Uh, this is something that you know, it does get a little bit underscored because most of the carriers operate on the same service schedule. They, a lot of them offer very congruent service formats, uh, getting things, you know, where they need to be, et cetera. But there's all sorts of other variables such as weather, uh, you know, other freight moving, delays at other shippers, other consignees, uh, where they're, you know, handing that off. So the more streamlined their operation is, obviously that's going to have, you know, that's going to put them at the forefront of a lot of people looking for carriers, such as Old Dominion has a reputation, or a lot, uh, less than truckload carrier out there, that has really uh, you know, made a reputation and has done a really good job of being very consistent and reliable with their service. And that translates into a higher rate uh, for a lot of people. Um, carrier competition, of course, this is the biggest one out there uh, right now, keeping, uh, you know, it, it is why that the, the market is so uh, tight when it's tight, and you know that's why the carriers when they get a chance that rate will jump up really fast uh, because the competition is just so significant a lot of these years like 2019 just last year we were talking about uh, the massive amount of exits uh, because a lot of these carriers it was it was just oversaturated it's almost a purely competitive marketplace uh, in the way that a lot of these carriers are competing consistently. You get a low rate, they can come in and, you know, they're knocking down a lot of these companies' doors every other year, just saying, I can cut that rate, I can offer you better service, et cetera. That of course puts a downward pressure on the rate in general and keeps it uh, capped most of the time. Uh, shipper variance. So essentially how much is in the budget for, uh, for paying for this transportation cost? How easy? Is it for a shipper to, uh, you know, work with a carrier? Do they have facilities set up? Uh, do they have a good dock space? Do they have a good uh, rapport? Do they understand the carrier's uh, basic needs to have consistency? Uh, do they have a consistent product that they're moving uh, back and forth? And, uh, and then again, any special needs, such as do they need re refrigerated, uh, you know, items? Do they need temperature control? Hazmat, of course, a big thing. And then are you... Uh, a just-in-time operation where you need to have a very stringent schedule of pickups and deliveries with not a lot of uh, variance in there. So these are all influencing factors uh, in, in the, you know, at the base of the market. Uh, capacity, as Tom mentioned earlier. So the biggest, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues with, uh, you know, the trucking space in terms of understanding, you know, why rates fluctuate so much is the fact that Nobody can really tell how much availability uh, is out there at any given time. Even the largest carrier, uh, Knight Swift, uh, which has roughly you know, about 20,000 uh, units, has no more than 2% of the overall market. Uh, that, is, that is not like any other industry in the, in the world where you have this level of fragmentation. 93% of the carriers, not of the equipment, but 93% of the carriers have less than 20 trucks in their fleets. And of course, there's also the private fleets uh, that are ebbing and flowing within uh, a lot of the, uh, these companies. 
have an influence as well, uh, as they are also part of that whole pie of having capacity to offer. Uh, and a lot of times when you do have a private fleet, that'll take on some of that, you know, more consistent freight in general. So that leaves the, you know, a lot of the four hire carriers, you know, jumping in to get a lot of this, what we call irregular freight, uh, things that you can't necessarily rely on being there every single day. Uh, and that does, you know, going back to the carrier networks makes a big impact on, uh, on what we see with the carrier networks. And, uh, and we never know, uh, or we don't have it, seeing as there are so many different players in the market, it's very hard to group them all into one single bucket. Uh, you know, like I have, you know, in this pie, it, nobody has a pure visible uh, look into how many of these carriers are positioned in Los Angeles versus how many are positioned in Philadelphia and Atlanta at any given time uh, throughout the year. The biggest one has 2% visibility at tops. So, you know, that puts a lot of people in a bad spot. So transitioning into, you know, how do we look at the market? How do we measure the market? Uh, it's basically the market rate. We've divided it into two categories. This is an oversimplified version of what the market really is. And, and the contracted freight consists of the most, uh, you know, the largest portion of the market itself. This is the, this is the stuff that uh, carriers have, you know, contracted with larger shippers in general, where they have a consistent amount of freight and they have a long-term agreement normally on a 12-month cycle. Uh, one, of the, one of the flaws of this agreement, however, it's not like a traditional contracted agreement that says, hey, I'm gonna get 3,000 widgets from you next month. You're gonna buy those 3,000 widgets, so that means that they're gonna produce those 3,000 widgets uh, from wherever you're sourcing it. This is not like that agreement. This is simply stating if the carrier happens to be available uh, and you have the freight and they agree to take that freight, that means that you now are going to be only be charged that rate itself. So it's not like a traditional procurement cycle contracted agreement where it's like shipper A is going to provide five loads a day out of Dallas going to Atlanta uh, and carrier B is not going to provide five trucks a day going from Dallas to Atlanta unless they specifically state that into a what we would call a dedicated agreement a dedicated account so a lot of people confuse the fact that dedicated and contract are the same thing dedicated is more about you almost have to think of yourself when they do enter these agreements like the shipper owning that asset or that capacity because they are going to pay a consistent rate over time per month it's even over time it's not necessarily even per mile uh, a lot of times it's just simply this is how much it costs for you to own this equipment because effectively if you have the loads or not that truck is going to show up there and you're going to have to pay for it and that's that's the way to get through some of this volatility especially if you have a lot of consistent freight moving um, but the part of the market that we're talking about today is more focused on that contracted freight where you don't guarantee capacity you're not guaranteeing the volume uh, itself. So it is kind of a loose uh, arrangement or an agreement, if you will, which is why it is so volatile itself. Uh, so contract, again, accounts for the majority of the movements, uh, somewhere between 80 to 90 percent uh, of the freight movements in the United States operate under some form of contract. Uh, so that just means, again, stable rate per mile when it's offered in the truckload space. Um, and then you have the spillover freight, and this is ad hoc or transactional freight that operates outside of these contracted freight movements. Um, you don't have to have a contract to just operate entirely on the spot market, uh, which a lot of shippers and carriers do. Uh, the spot market is simply just a near-term rate uh, focused on whatever that specific move is for that day, uh, and it doesn't have any ties to uh, you know, any other consistency thereafter. That agreement is done. Um, it's a one-time move, uh, more than likely, and it, it is extremely volatile. Uh, but at the same time, the contracted freight rates tend to have gravity to these spot rates. The, this is where uh, you know, you're not gonna go out and pay you know, 30% higher than your contracted freight rate without you know, a lot of need to get that capacity. And that's some of what we're seeing right now in the spot market is simply 
they are trying to guarantee their capacity by getting some of these carriers to, you know, or charging or some of these carriers are charging more just to make sure uh, that they're covered in this environment because so many shippers are trying to bid for their capacity on a near term basis. Uh, a lot of people know that this is not going to last forever. This market is extremely, um, you know, tenuous at best because of all the uncertainty, buzzword alert in 2020. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a, uh, you know, real thing where the spot freight does give you an indication of what the market conditions are like. Uh, so how do you measure spot rates? Well, there's a lot of load boards out there, DAT, truckstop.com. Uh, there's multiple, you know, there's multiple companies that have their own load boards uh, that give an idea of what, uh, you know, it is costing a lot of uh, shippers to move freight right now. And, you know, spot rates are a good indication of what's going on right now. And you can see in the graph right here that it does ebb and flow. And there's a lot of seasonality to this spot freight. And traditionally, we see uh, two peaks a year and one in the summer and one in uh, coming up here around Christmas. Uh, simply due to, there's two, obviously the supply and demand issues here, but supply side where the carriers are uh, not available as much. There's people taking vacations on the carrier end, uh, depleting their network, but there's also a lot of freight moving right before and, and during these times because you have the end of quarter uh, right there at July 4th, but there's a lot of summer freight uh, that needs to move, but carriers are trying to take vacations. So that limits uh, the amount of uh, you know, availability that they're going to have around that time. And it creates these little mini upward movements in the spot market or in the spot rate. This is outside of your contracted freight movement. Uh, and then that's what we call, you know, our peak seasons throughout the year. Right now, there's no such thing as a traditional seasonal pattern. Uh, peak season is not really uh, moving. So varies, you know, spot rates, you know, we're specifically talking about truckload here, but by mode, uh, you're talking about reefer can be anywhere from 45 to 60 percent uh, of the market. Flatbed is almost entirely on uh, spot freight. There's very little contracted freight movement for flatbed. And just think about the type of commodities that's involved with both of those. And again, reefer uh, availability, a lot less than that dry van or that traditional truckload. And LTL, almost none of it is on the spot market simply due to the fact that they need to have more consistency uh, and what their network demands, uh, simply because there's a lot more moving pieces. They're looking at space on a trailer, not just point A to point B. Uh, and they move, they move a lot of freight in different directions across the country, uh, different times and different amounts of it at that. So there's a lot more uh, complexity to that, but uh, for sure we're gonna focus on a uh, truckload for this, the purposes of this. So the way that we measure contract market, one of the tools that we use is this, uh, the CAS invoicing company produces an index. Uh, it gives a good general idea of direction of what uh, shippers are starting to pay. Uh, the CAS truckload line haul index is a pure uh, me uh, measure of, you know, what some of these long-term rates are. Now there is spot market influence in this, uh, but it, it, it stays relatively minimal. And, and again, it's pretty representative of the overall market in general, just because you're talking about invoices to shippers from carriers. And a lot of these are bigger uh, carriers and shippers at that. So it is going to be a little bit uh, more, you know, determined by some of these longer term agreements. And you can see in 2017 to 2018, it's a very slow process uh, where we see this movement upward. 2017, uh, one of the most volatile markets uh, in history. Uh, we had the hurricanes in August, but we had a, you know, an economic boom uh, driving a lot of that freight demand up. And then we also had the ELD implementation that uh, you know, everybody was concerned about, a, a supply side contraction there. Uh, so using all of those things, a lot of these carriers were able to get uh, uh, you know, significant rate increases. And you could see this coming, and, I can, and I'm going to show you that in a bit. But by the time you see the cast line haul index uh, go up like it's going uh, here, it's generally too late. The market has already turned. So the contracted freight uh, itself is very uh, sticky. It's slow to move, if you will. Now, looking at some of our alternative data, uh, specifically the ones we have access to are the tender rejections. Uh, simply the amount of uh, you know, load tenders, electronic tenders, that a shipper sends over to a carrier, what percentage of those is getting rejected? Uh, 
this is one of those uh, things that's, again, these are contracted freight movements and large. Uh, so a lot of agreements in place here where the shipper, uh, you know, is basically asking that carrier, well, we agreed upon this rate last year. Uh, I have a load for you. The carrier says yes or no to that. The more often that they say no to that, that's the more, that's the higher chance that that is going to fall into the spot market. Now there's going to be a few carriers that get a chance beneath the primary carrier and the secondary carrier, et cetera, depending on the depth uh, of the shipper's route guide. But the more often that things are getting rejected, the more likelihood that they're going to enter the spot market, which again, does not, it's a no holds barred environment where a lot of uh, carriers and, and shippers basically are just freely negotiating uh, whatever they can, and the rates are as high as you want as they can get, and they can also get lower, uh, depending on the market itself, than uh, where the contracted rate was. Right now, we're in an environment where, uh, you know, the spot market is operating at a much higher level than that contracted freight rate. So the longer the spot market, the higher these tender rejection rates go, the longer it stays at an elevated level, uh, the, lo the harder the gravity is on the contracted rate moving it up. And this is the essence of the market influence itself. Uh, this is how you measure it. It's basically the, the near-term supply-demand imbalance, the longer it stays out of balance, one direction or the other, is the direction that that rate is going to move. Um, and again, carriers are very reluctant to reject their freight from their long-standing customers, their shippers. They're providing a service. They want to uh, provide this service, but there is a certain threshold that we found uh, specifically with, you know, these tender rejection rates, which again is a measure uh, where carriers simply just, they, it just breaks. The relationships break because it costs too much. Uh, they're leaving too much money on the table uh, to supply, to make sure that their, uh, their contracted accounts are getting serviced 100% or at a high level. So they have to go uh, and get some of these, uh, you know, higher dollar amounts because the market is demanding that they do. Otherwise, they're going to be making five, four or 5% margins in a lot of areas where they could be making, you know, three to 10 times as much uh, in the open market. Uh, so the market simply just forces them into that. It'd be like uh, on the shipping side, it'd be like a provider offering you uh, the same product for, you know, a 10th of the cost. It's as a business itself, they simply cannot uh, turn down that opportunity. Otherwise, next year when the tables turn again, it, it makes it really hard in a challenging environment if demand drops and they don't have the freight to move and now they haven't taken advantage of some of these higher revenue moves and now they're out of business in the next year. So it just doesn't make sense uh, for the carrier at a certain point to stay compliant overall, but also it's really hard for them to do that operationally because the, uh, the networks, as Tom mentioned, uh, get very disrupted very fast and they cannot keep their, their trucks in the, same, in the right positions to service that freight. So right here we can see tender volumes compared with tender rejection rates. Like I said, looking at it in this year, it's a demand side influence. The amount of tenders jumping up there in March really pushed those tender rejections up. So as demand increased significantly, it comes back down uh, after demand falls off, tender rejection rates follow that. Uh, and then again, demand's back up again uh, and tender rejection rates stay elevated. If you look back in December uh, on the tender rejection rate, which is in the blue line there, it goes up as demand's falling. And again, that is the supply side influence of the environment of the nature of a holiday. So, Here's an illustration of how the short term will drive that long term rate. I have that CAS truckload line haul index in green, along with the PPI for long distance truckload, uh, you know, costs uh, measured by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then I have the outbound tender rejection index in blue there. And you can see tender rejection rates in uh, 2018 were very elevated for a very long period of time. You almost can't even pick out uh, the peak season influence there uh, in July, uh, but they came back down, they were elevated in March, came back down into April and May, and then jumped back up in July. And you see those long-term contracted rates and the CAS line haul index and PPI stay up as tender rejection rates come back down. So carriers became more compliant uh, as those rates increased 
as the contracted rates aligned with those spot rates a little bit more significantly, making it easier for carriers to, uh, to operate as demand uh, actually fell through 2018 and 2019 on the backside, but rates, the contracted rates actually stayed higher, but tender rejection rates also came back down as the market rate came in alignment with those contracted rates. Uh, like I said, as they move towards the, uh, you know, the market rate, as it were, carriers are able to uh, really be a little bit more compliant and easier to work with for sure. Uh, freight balance. Again, Tom hit on this a little bit. If you look at those blue markets out there, those are the markets that are very dependent on the, uh, that's the production markets of the, uh, of the United States as it stands right now. Some people think that it always stays this color all the time. Uh, some of these markets do. Uh, looking down there in Miami and Lakeland, Florida, uh, they tend to stay very consumer driven, consumer oriented. A lot of freight going in, not a lot coming out. This is where the carrier is gonna charge you more to go into Florida from an Atlanta, where you see Atlanta there is in the blue, uh, and Savannah right there up the coast also in the blue, as a lot of freight comes out of it. As it goes into these red areas, you're gonna get charged a premium for that because the carrier has to pay to get back out without freight. And uh, inconsistent volumes really play a big role there. Uh, so I wanna show this one, this is how it plays out. Seattle, Los Angeles, on the spot market here, Seattle, Los Angeles stays consistently high at a pretty decent level. And then you see down there that Los, or, uh, yeah, Los Angeles to Seattle stays consistently high, whereas Seattle to Los Angeles stays consistently low. You're looking at 84 cents a mile <laughs> in this chart versus $3 a mile. And that in itself is, it costs the exact same amount for a carrier to move those, those loads, those distances. They're the same mileage, but the influence of imbalance and the opportunity cost of missing out on other freight in the Los Angeles area, et cetera, drive that Los Angeles to Seattle rate higher. Whereas that Seattle to Los Angeles rate where they're not gonna have as much freight uh, potential is suppressed significantly. And that in a nutshell is a head haul Los Angeles to back haul Seattle market. And that is really what drives down the freight uh, rate generally. Um, and that's what you're paying for a lot of time is that opportunity uh, cost where you may be going into an area where it's not conducive. And ultimately, it comes down to leverage. Uh, most of the time, shippers uh, can name, you know, their price to an extent. Uh, there, is an, there is a floor on the contracted rates to an extent, uh, you know, where a lot of the carriers cost are similar, et cetera. But uh, a lot of times carriers are so in a, such abundance, they're knocking on shippers doors uh, and they keep a downward pressure on those rates because these carriers effectively, you know, they, you know, they're setting the prices, they're setting the rates, they're willing to undercut their own costs at, at times. Um, so that's why you see these wild fluctuations uh, persist is as the pendulum moves one direction or the other. Uh, right now we're in a carrier centric market. Uh, but again, a lot of these carriers know it's not, it's probably not going to last forever. Um, and it'll go right back uh, to being a little bit cooler market here. And, you know, I couldn't tell you when at this point, but, uh, you know, this is just basically the way that the market works is as uh, shippers and carriers become aware of their leverage. That's when uh, we see the wildest fluctuations in rates. And that will conclude my section uh, of the presentation. Fantastic, Zach. Thanks so much. I, I do know that we're getting close to the end of the scheduled hour. However, I'm going to make the call that we uh, we extend class a little bit here. If you got to go, you got to go. But meanwhile, Zach, I've been addressing some questions, the easy ones on the chat, but I'm going to direct some of the harder ones to you here uh, with the time uh, that, that we do uh, want to stick around and, and take questions. And encourage folks, if you do have questions, please, it's not too late to get the questions. I'm watching the, uh, the board here. So, Zach, you, you, you talked about the, again, all these forces driving fluctuation and certainly uh, conventional practice in recent years has been to index contracts against fuel. Uh, we saw how fluctuating fuel can be and that's a significant cost driver for the carrier. However, do you see any other changes in procurement maybe moving forward, whether it's shorter term contracts, maybe seasonal contracts or using other uh, forms of, uh, of input to index rates? 
Yeah, for sure. We're already seeing uh, a lot of the larger shippers in the country uh, have many bids, uh, which are, you know, rollouts. You know, we, we it's not a new invention by any means, but depending on the amount of uh, freight you have control over, it makes a lot of sense to not bid it all out while the market is potentially, you know, at its highest level of activity where carriers have all the leverage. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to purchase at a peak. This is finance 101. Uh, so you don't want to procure your, your transportation costs for the next year and set yourself up for paying too much of a premium on the current market conditions. Uh, you know, I was in pricing for a long time. And so we're all prisoners of the moment to an extent. There's, there's a little bit of that recency bias that always sticks with you and has an influence and rightfully so um, because it's, you know, the future is unknown and they have to take that into account. So some of these mini bids that only operate, you know, say seasonally or in the near term uh, make a lot of sense uh, for a lot of these companies to go through to uh, make sure that they're not necessarily paying peak price for their transportation. Yeah. Hey, that's a question about dedicated and private. And uh, the uh, person indicates that dedicated and private grew 13% uh, from 2017 to 18, another 5% from 18 to 19. The question is, what do you see as the trend to growth in dedicated and private during 2020 with the high level of disruption and change? Do you see more folks seeking uh, that degree of control, uh, controlling their own destiny with dedicated or private fleets? Yeah, I, I think I think you do. Although, you know, I think a lot of that is in that dedicated uh, sector uh, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, some of the stats I've looked at has been obviously more in the for hire sector. Uh, you know, a lot of these private fleets. Uh, again, before this, the private fleets were sort of in this exodus or somewhat contractory state uh, because a lot of the companies that own these private fleets have grandfathered in their transportation departments simply because they didn't have uh, carriers that were able to, uh, you know, provide those services for them in the past. Uh, so we had seen some of the private fleets starting to contract a little bit, whereas the, the dedicated in this type of environment, we would expect that to grow pretty significantly, uh, along with, you know, as they're trying to avoid these wild fluctuations. And what's going to make it challenging, though, is that these volumes are really hard to forecast at this point. So that's the other side of the equation. I think back in 2018, uh, everybody kind of thought this was the new normal. Uh, I don't think anybody's really going to think 2020 is the new normal uh, by any means moving forward. So I don't think that we're going to see, uh, you know, maybe not as much <laughs> of that growth uh, in the dedicated environment, but I think we'll definitely see it grow uh, here into 2021 just because of the environment itself is so uncertain. Yeah, let's hope 2020 doesn't become the reference point. Really <laughs> yeah this year out. But anyway, hey, going to a question that Rob uh, kind of set up at the outset with his comments, you know, th there are many people that interface with procurement um, in their organization that, you know, they're buying widgets and, and eaches and lo looking for that lowest per unit price. And they just have a really hard time understanding how we can see such fluctuation uh, in the going rate for transportation move. And I think something we've tried to do is to eliminate, you know, if anyone ever says it depends, it depends on so many factors here, right? But how can you help those folks to eliminate, you know, that we're not buying a widget, it's not a commodity. And, and frankly, if you commoditize transportation, I think you're going to be sorely uh, um, mistaken to do so in the long run. But how, how can folks better communicate that uh, this is a highly dynamic uh, activity and the individual origin destination, the nature of the commodity, all the things that we illuminated here factor in uh, to the dynamics of this market. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I mean, I think both sides, shipper and carrier both, uh, talk about the longstanding relationships uh, being an influencing factor and, and looking at transportation like a pure commodity purchase uh, is, is, is not a great way of looking at it in general uh, because you do rely on that carrier, that provider uh, to be there and reliable. And of course, just like any relationship, the more familiar, the more uh, trustworthy you both are with each other, the more you're sharing with each other, that's going to build that relationship and it's going to allow you, you're definitely not going to, you know, abandon some, uh, you know, a business partner or associate that you, you know, 
personally feel close to or that has been there for you that you're relying on. Um, so it is important. The problem with that is in practice, uh, you can have a lot of different interactions with that same relationship in those various organizations. Uh, and then you have turnover, et cetera, and then things go haywire like they are this year, and that breaks down a lot of these communication barriers. But, uh, you know, if you do focus on, you know, managing your relationships with, and making that part of that transportation negotiation process versus just purely looking at it as a, um, you know, simple, I'm purchasing this from you and that's the end of it. Yeah, you're definitely going to have a lot better success at, at you know hedging yourself against these volatile market swings. Yeah, it's it's uh, capturing costs is is relatively easy compared to capturing value and and quantifying that. And I think, you know, I, I had that that notion of of the value of service out there, and it's still a really hard thing. You know, what's it worth to you to have highly reliable transportation service? But I, I think that. For one thing, over the last six, seven months, I, I think we've realized how hard, it, how much it hurts when it's when it's lacking or where you can't find it, right? And right. so, uh, hopefully, there's. You mentioned the recency effect. Um, you know, we're all experiencing some some challenging times now. Well, hey, Zach, thank you so much for for shedding light on uh, the contemporary aspects of the market and sharing the tools that you all have available there at Freight Waves and make available to all of us. We really appreciate that. And, uh, also would like to, to thank uh, Chris and CSCMP, uh, Rob and uh, the Consumer Brands Association, as well as the team at the University of Tennessee, the Global Supply Chain Institute, particularly Hannah and Michelle, uh, Hannah Kirby and Michelle Painter that made today possible. Chris, I see you came off the mic, so I don't know if there's anything you want to offer in closing. No, I just want to thank everyone for the contributions. This is an important topic that Rob brought to our attention, and we thank all the contributors very much, and particularly the support staff. Without them, uh, without Hannah, we none of us would have been performing as well as we did. So thanks to all of you, and, and the best of luck. I hope this was meaningful. The feedback is very important for us uh, to continue this type of content. Excellent. Well, be safe, stay well, and we hope to see you again soon. And for those of you that submitted questions we didn't quite get enough time to get to, we'll try to offer you a response offline so that your question gets answered. But thanks again to everyone. Be safe and uh, keep it moving. Bye, everyone. Bye.